Today is September 28, 2020. My name is Dana Yarrick. I'm interviewing Mar Vivalo for the Latino Oral History Project, Voces of a Pandemic Project at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know Ms. Vivaldo that this interview will be placed in the Northern Illinois University Libraries and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you wanna talk about, please bring it up and we will talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are several questions we need to do to make sure you agree to before we go on. The Center for Latino and Latin American Studies wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs or other documentation at the Northern Illinois University Libraries. Northern Illinois University Libraries will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. So question number one, do you give the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Northern Illinois University Libraries? Uh, yes, I consent. Do you grant Northern Illinois University Libraries right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Uh, yes. Do you agree to allow Northern Illinois University Libraries to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to share your interview and your materials with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History Mini Project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Uh, yes. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that you and I have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure VOSE server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOSE sends it to the Benson Library and NIU libraries, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or your family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library and NIU libraries. So do you wish to, for us to share the rest of that pre-interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson and NIU libraries? Uh, yeah, I agree. On occasion, the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies and BOSIS receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Okie doke. So we got that out of the way. Um, let's get started. Tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, your family background. Uh, well, I'm Latinx family member. Um, my name's Maribel. I grew up in the, I grew up um, moving around a bit, but my family settled in Elgin and that's where um, I went to school, I graduated, and you know, I've been working. I've been a CNA, a certified nursing assistant for about eight years. And you know, that's what I do for a majority. I have an interest in art and I love dogs. Um, see, I can't think of anything else, <laughs> but yeah. Why did you decide to go into nursing? It pays the bills. <laughs> art, you can't. It's hard to pay bills with art, unfortunately. So I figured a CNA will cover this stuff while I go study other stuff in the meantime. And it, it's been working out pretty good so far. I mean, I like what I do. I like helping people. You know, I feel like that's really a job that mo more people, especially for CNAs, like it's not appreciated enough. But, you know, um, I try to do my best with, you know, what I do. And, you know, my goal is just to make sure when, when my residents or patients are happy. So, you know, I try to do the, my best there. <laughs> what kind of art do you do? Uh, I do a whole lot. I can do, right now I have an interest in screen printing. 
and that's what I've been studying for the past maybe two to three semesters, but I also studied printmaking, I studied jewelry, I studied ceramics, I studied sculpture work, I, um, and right now I just do a bunch of um, mostly figure drawings of women, but um, I've been trying to do more like um, more grand pieces, like bigger screen prints and stuff. Cool. So you've been working as a CNA uh, and during the pandemic with some COVID patients. Um, mm-hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about where you work, um, what kind of facility it is, and who the patients are that you serve? Okay. Well, I just started this job back in, I want to say late February. It's a rehabilitation place. And during the back in February, we it was during when like the pandemic was still like it wasn't considered a pandemic. It was still at the start of it, and you know there was like a lot of people discussing about the virus. But my facility was you know rehab. We do knee. We take care of people that just had any type of knee surgery or like they just broke a leg or they're recovering from some grand surgery. And then I think in March, we had a COVID person come Well, we had someone test positive for COVID. And that's when, you know, everything like we had to right away transition to getting a COVID stuff settled. And the way my facility did it, we we have three floors and um, the first floor was empty. It wasn't supposed to be used, but we converted one of them to be a COVID area. You're going to hear my dog growling right now. Okay. Uh, but yeah. The first, Pablo, quiet. Pablo. Sorry, just hold him down. But yeah, our co- we had one per- some person's delivering uh, medicine for my Nana. And he thinks it's danger. Pablo ah. knows. But yeah, our we had... One person has positive for COVID. So then our whole facility got tested and we ended up having more people end up positive. So we had to convert even more of our first floor into a COVID unit. And luckily my job was able to get a negative pressure um, system for the air. So it can be filtrated better. And luckily with that, it was just a better place for, um, if you work in the COVID, it's more safer than having a non-filtrated area. And I think in the COVID unit, we only had like maybe four to five people with COVID. So it wasn't like an extreme, like big, big, uh, like um, a big um, unit, like hospitals would have whole wings dedicated to COVID, I think, or whole floors or sections so and immediately we had to like wear n95 masks or we you know we started putting on more ppe until like we were like okay this is now part of your uniform you have to wear your gown as soon as you come in you have to wear goggles n95 masks surgical mask um the booties and the little hair net things for yourself so, you know, it just, it just happened really fast. As soon as we got one COVID person, like everything changed rapidly. And how do you feel about those measures that were taken as far as PPE and protecting um, yourselves as you're working with the patients? I mean, like it's smart and, you know, I'm happy it happened so fast because um, at my old job, I still talk to some of the old employees they they were I think still not being given a bunch of appropriate PPE and you know I was just happy that I had you know N95 master for sure like one of the most important ways to protect yourself from getting sick along with goggles so you know just having that made me feel more secure and made me not feel as anxious as to going into like some of the people's rooms because while we were waiting for like some of the other test results to come back from patients you were just like you know what if this person has covid like you like it was basically like russian roulette like if you're not careful with someone or if you accidentally like touch something and you know you don't wash your hands right away or you don't use hand sanitizer and you 
for some reason touch your face or like touch something that later on you you touch and grab your hands or it you know goes near your mouth or something like you can get yourself sick and stuff but yeah it's just having pp is just like so important yeah are the patients uh elderly or what what are what is the patient population like Mm, well, most of the patients, I would say, are generally between, I, I would say the youngest is maybe late 50s, early 60s, and the oldest was probably maybe 80 to 90. So it's a pretty big age range since, but we had had, like, I've had a patient who was like maybe 38. They got into a big um, accident and their whole leg had to be like, it had surgery and everything. So, but it's kind of rare to have someone that young. But yeah, a majority of my, of the patients were just, you know, relatively, relatively young compared to most nursing home ages. But we did have some people that are really um, in the older side. <laughs> Man. And talk a little bit about your duties and your interactions with the patients that you serve. Uh, so for my facility, um, originally, since it was a rehab, it's a rehab place, you wouldn't really do too much with the patients because the idea was that these people are like rehabilitation. They can do a lot of stuff. So at the beginning, I would be passing out eyes. I would be getting their vitals. And if they needed help between between I got there at two o'clock and um, I would do all those things before dinner and I would try to fit in a shower because some of them you know if they have a broken leg they can't really take a shower by themselves and we would help them so we would do that and but for the most part most people didn't re really need a whole lot of assistance but then because um, since there was such a huge spike of COVID we had to, the facility had to take in a bunch of people that really don't, don't count as rehab. It was a bunch of people that had more dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, really total care people. And, um, you know, it just made it harder because our staffing wise, it wasn't really suited to be taking in those types of people because um, we had maybe eight to nine people but then at the end, during, well, now we're starting to get, like, I would have, like, maybe 15 residents, and I would, and it would just be me, so, and these people need more help, they need to be, they're incontinent, so I need to change their pads and stuff, or I need to, like, lift them or stuff, and I would have more people that are a Hoyer lift, meaning that I have to use a machine to lift them up, because they're unable to help at all. And I have more bed bound people and it's just more work on the person. And when you have a lot of people that require a lot of help, um, it's just, you're running around from like one end of your section to the other end. But you know, you still have your people that are mixed in that are alert orientated um, and you need to like help them. So it's just, it's been starting to be like more stressful, but um, you know, you just have to keep rolling with it because you know you know it's, at the end of the day these people need help and you need to help them <laughs> until yeah. they can get better but yeah so people that need more help than before the pandemic uh yeah. and also a lot of stress on you to try to to try to serve yeah. them and to serve serve actually more people than you're used to yeah. that must have made it difficult to um keep yourself safe with, with the yeah. PPE and all that and, and patient contact. Yeah, because like the, the last time I worked, um, what was it? It was, a, it was kind of stressful. Let me see. I think we had, our floor had maybe 29 patients and we were three, I think we were three CNAs. So when we split it up, everybody had like seven or, wait, we had nine. So, and ninth's a little bit easier to work with because, you know, and luckily I've been working that section so I know um, who needed help at what time because I can keep track of what the patient's schedule is. Like, oh, this person likes to go to the bathroom at this time or this person likes to 
they usually get up and they sit in the chair for a while until dinner's done. And, you know, and you just have to, as long as you know your people and you can keep track of what their schedule is kind of like, it gets easier. But at the same time, like if for whatever reason, someone puts on the call light and, you know, it's out of sync with your usual schedule, you kind of just have to, okay, I need to run over there, figure out what they need and hopefully it doesn't take too much time so I can get back to this person. So, you know, it's just a bunch of juggling that you have to do. And, you know, when you, you know, have to keep in mind that if you have someone that has um, their in infection control room, because, you know, we're, we're, as soon as we get to work, we put on our gown, our N95, our mask, our goggles. And when you go inside someone's room that has like an infection control disease, you have to put on another set of uh, gown to cover your original gown because you're wearing that in the facility regardless if you're in a room or not. So you have to put on a protective gown to protect your your original gown. And you have to put on like, um, you know, you have to make sure your N95 mask is clean. So, uh, so sorry. So putting on like more PPE to keep track of everything is just like, um, you go in, do your whatever you need to do. And then you have to take off the, the outer PPE so you can go back to the hallway. So and you have to make sure your original PPE doesn't get dirty. So it's just, you know, you have to just be so careful with it and stuff. Yeah. And putting like, on, yeah, and putting on, putting on PPE is just like, it takes around a good minute taking it off. Usually you want to take a, you want to take it slow so it doesn't get dirty and stuff. So it's just a lot of putting back and forth, removing stuff, keeping stuff clean and things. But yeah. Like being in a play and having costume changes all the time, and that call Thanks. light goes on, and you gotta. <laughs> yeah, you have to scoot over. You have to scoot over there and get it done. Yeah, oh. but yeah, I'm just glad because we're not using, um, like the PP that we're kind of supposed to, because we we really want to like store. I know my work has like a a big storage of PP. Um, but right now I think we're using a lot of raincoats to for gowns because we want to make sure like the good PP we have it in case we have like a huge outbreak of COVID in the COVID unit. Because right now I think we have like seven people if I'm remembering right. And you know, seven people with COVID where you constantly taking off things and putting it on is just like a lot. I would I would think I maybe go through at least four pairs of PPE for a single room in each shift. So at seven, that's like 28 pairs of PPE that you're, you know, using and discarding <laughs> and stuff. So, and that stuff doesn't grow on trees, unfortunately, especially right now. But yeah. So despite precautions and having PPE, uh, et cetera, you did get a, a COVID diagnosis yourself. When did you yeah. find out that, that you were positive for the virus? I found out on Friday that I had COVID and I think that was what the 20, today's the 28th, right? Mm -hmm. 25th, but, I guess. Yeah, I think it was 25th that I got it. And you know, I, I, when, cause my facility called me, it was the administrator and the wounds nurse that had let me know I had it. And you know, they were, they were asking me questions like doing contact tracing, trying to figure out where I got it. And, you know, I went to, I think during the week I had, I had before I got in COVID, I had maybe gone to like a grocery store. I went to Aldi, you know, I, you know, I was just doing like the minimal stuff, you know, getting groceries, maybe going to like a corner store to buy like random little utilities that I forgot to get. But, you know, you just never know when you're gonna get it, and you know I'm still don't know if I got if I got it from work or if I got it from being out in public, because you know just one little mess up and you can get it and stuff. And I had worked the COVID unit maybe the Saturday before, and but you know I had worked the COVID unit maybe two times before then, so you know you just don't know. You know it's unfortunate, but like. You know, eventually I was probably going to get it because I work at such a high, you know, high risk place. I mean, we have COVID people, so 
you know, it, it was bound to happen. So I'm just glad that right now my symptoms are relatively, um, relatively manageable and, you know, I'm not struggling to breathe and I'm not like having severe issues. So you are in quarantine now for two weeks? Yep, Can 10 more days. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about what that's like? Um, well, I have my own place, so I don't, well, my Nana lives upstairs, so I'm not too worried about, like, getting her sick, though when I did find out I had COVID, you know, I told all my friends and family, like, anybody who I hanged out with for, like, maybe a week before, I was just like, you should probably go get yourself tested, and then after I did that, I was just like, okay, time to find something to do for two weeks. But yeah, I'm with my dog. He's with me. So at least I won't go crazy talking to myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, mostly it's just been like, um, one of my symptoms for COVID is just being so tired. So um, I think maybe the last three days I've been trying to like clean my apartment, but I did the dishes that tired me out. So I had to go take a nap. Um, I put all my clothes away, had to, that got me tired, so I went to go take a nap. Um, luckily my, um, what's it called? My mother has been dropping me off some food. Um, she made me some teas, so I've been eating that. And my Nana, who lives upstairs, she gave me some Sprite to drink, because that's her cure for a lot of things. And, you know, it's been helping. Um... But yeah, it's mostly just been trying to make my apartment comfy and just sleeping a lot, honestly. Yeah, um, I do have like a slight cough, but it's nothing like, um, like I can't breathe cough. It's just like my throat has a tickle and I need to like get rid of it and stuff. Yeah. How about support from your workplace? Are, are you getting paid while you're in quarantine? Um, I'm getting paid sickly for it for the days I was supposed to work and it's not too bad um, it's not like my full pay but it's you know something that can at least help me cover the bills and stuff and my work was really nice when you know they told me I had it like my administrator was just like if you need anything just let me know you can text me and you know she's a very sweet lady and I do appreciate her a lot she was just like if you want me to pick up groceries for you just let me know and I'm just like oh it's okay I know an administrator is really busy so, so I won't ask this of you um, but yeah, she was really sweet. My wounds nurse to, to um, let me know. She was just like very sweet about it too. She's just like, just focus on getting better. You know, they called me to make sure like, what are your symptoms? Are you still okay? And stuff like that. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, I take my temperature. It's 98 today. It's pretty normal. It's in range. So, you know, they've been very nice and stuff. And um, what's it called? But yeah, for the most part, it's just been, it's been good. Yeah. Uh, have you had other coworkers who have tested positive or, or are you the first one? Um, in the past, we've had, I, I want to say maybe five coworkers test positive too. And it's mostly just, you know, the same thing. Everybody goes on a two week quarantine. And if you if you're healthy enough and you're not showing any symptoms, you can go back to work and stuff. So, but I've never had it happen to me. So I'm going to message my coworkers and be like, so are, are you going to go back to work right away or and stuff like that? So we'll see. I know I, I've taught, I think we've had maybe one person. Well, the thing is, like, they're very private about it, so I, like, I honestly don't know who'd had COVID before, but I know it's, like, five people, because they'll send out a mass text to us saying, like, um, one person tested positive for COVID and stuff, because they like to keep us informed about everything, but, you know, they don't tell us who it is, like, you know, because it's obviously a HIPAA violation and stuff, but just to let us know, like, something, like, someone did test positive. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. So your life has, is changing right now, obviously, uh, yeah. with this. But uh, before that, how, how has your family's life and your life changed during the pandemic? How have routines changed and stuff like that? 
Mm, well, I would say like when I think we had, well, obviously I have two siblings who are still in high school and they had to transition to like online learning and you know they're luckily they're like already in high school so they already know how to work a computer so they're not struggling with it but i've my i've had people whose kids don't know how to do it because they're like so young they don't know how to work it so we don't have to worry for them they know how to get online how to use zoom and stuff um my older sisters are also doing zoom either for work or for school and stuff so you know it's just a lot of staying home and stuff um my mother on the other hand she works at a factory so like obviously there's like a lot of worry because you know they're they're space apart and they're you know six feet apart and stuff but you know they're inside it's kind of you're always kind of worried and stuff and i think she, her workplace had a couple of people test positive for covid so, you know, they had everybody be on a two-week quarantine, but luckily she tested negative, so it wasn't too much of a worry for her, but she's back at work, so we're always kind of just like, okay, we need to be careful with mom, make sure she doesn't get COVID. Um, and then my Nana, who is retired, so um, she usually stays home, so it hasn't been a big change for her she just can't see her friends as often which is a little sad but you know we have a lot of phone calls and stuff um i wouldn't really say like um, for me anything has changed because regardless of covid i'm still going to work you know we have places we don't close we're open 24 7 so i don't i the only thing that's changed is you know i can't go to a restaurant i can't really go you know go to movies and stuff but you know you understand why you can't do it so you don't mull over it and stuff um but yeah I, I don't know personally for me I feel like since I'm still going to work I, I feel like things haven't changed um but you know you still miss going out and being in like maybe large groups of people or going to the park and stuff um I guess for my siblings, they just miss being with their friends at school because interaction when you're young is so important. <laughs> like you want to go with your friends, you want to go see them. I know my brother was bummed for a long time because, you know, he loves talking to his friends. And even though they're on Discord or they're on, you know, they're playing their video games together, it's just not the same seeing them in person. And so, so, you know, it's just, a little different but you know they're adapting to it so you know COVID's gonna be with us for at least two more years so it's just a lot of adapting we have to do with it. And you are in Elgin, Illinois, correct? Yeah, Elgin, how, Illinois. How has the community, how has Elgin been coping with the pandemic? Um, I feel like our, our community does it pretty good like um, like a lot, all, all the places that, you know, we have been to, like you have to wear your face covering, you have to wear a mask, like for, you know, not a lot of places have not been, you know, do have not been like, you know, ignoring that. Not like, you know, some other states where you can just go around and, you know, refuse to wear masks. Um, I feel like they've been doing a good job um, I know when, yeah, I'm not really sure to be honest, because, like, I don't really leave my house a lot to begin with, because, you know, as a, my job really doesn't want us to leave our houses unless it's, like, really, like, important, so, like, yeah, the only time I go out is for groceries, and, you know, everybody's still following the proper social distancing, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think they're doing a good job for the most part. How do they communicate that to you at your job that, you know, what, what you're doing in your private life, you know, uh, needs to conform to new situation? Um, well, they, like, they're just really, because we would have, like, um, meetings at the beginning of the pandemic, and they're just like, please, like, do not go out because you're a frontline medical worker. 
like we cannot afford to let you get sick and you know they're just like please don't like you know go get groceries but like don't go out to like a restaurant or don't go out to you know parties and stuff because you know there's a high chance you're gonna get sick if you go there and we're just like like yeah we get well I get it like I know some people who um I think they went to like a bar or something and you know in my head I'm just like we're in a pandemic what are you doing but I'm just like still like okay you know I'm on Twitter and I see people like posting um random like party videos and I'm just like okay like good luck with COVID when you get it but I'm just like all right and like you know it's it's a I don't know if people just don't um, you know realize how severe it is but you know I would hope people would have more common sense but apparently I can't be wrong <laughs> yeah oh we're getting some mixed messages too yeah, yeah. we're and getting from, mixed messages. from the outside world yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had mentioned uh your grandmother your mm -hmm. your abuela in, Me in Mexico mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that what, what it was like um um, yeah, well, my grandma in Mexico has unfortunately passed away. I think this is maybe maybe two weeks into it and stuff. And um, we, looking back at it now, we think she probably had COVID through like a lot of really like obscure like connections. Someone came into contact with her that probably had COVID and they unfortunately probably gave it to her. And for her, she already had some lung issues. So giving COVID or getting COVID just, you know, did a number on her lungs. So she passed maybe in about a span of a week of getting really sick and, you know, getting better, but then getting sick again. And, you know, it was hard because, you know, she's in Mexico and we're here in the United States and, you know, we couldn't just go and fly to be with her because it just happened so fast and we didn't have time to, like, prepare for it and stuff. So, you know, we're just, you know, waiting on um, news from a cousin or an uncle or an aunt and, you know, we're just, like, waiting back to hear from it. And I think we found out on... September uh, she died September 11 in the morning and you know when we all found out we just went to our mom's house and you know cried and you know we just like you know all huddled together and you know try to like remember our good times with her and you know it's just, just sad that we couldn't be with her but at least like our mom had a really a hard time with it because unfortunately she can't go to Mexico so, but she was able to have like one last phone call with her because our grandmother was like, you know, asking like, I want to talk to my Rita. I want to talk to her because um, I would say that our grandmother, um, we really grew up with her a lot and she, you know, babysat us a lot when our mom had to go back to work and stuff. And she was always like there for us from like she grew up mostly with us like sometimes she would go to a uncle's house or an aunt's house to help with their kids but she spent a majority of her time with us until she went back to Mexico but yeah losing her and you know when you look back and think it was probably COVID it's just like you know it's just more sad because you know you know unfortunately you will lose people to COVID especially the elderly because it's just too hard on them and but I just think back on like my time with her and you know that just helps me a lot <laughs> yeah was she hops hospitalized when when she died uh no because I think our they because I think the doctor that came to examine her at her house had told her like um you can either keep her here or you can take her to the hospital but he had told our uncle and aunt there, like, if you do take her to the hospital, even if she doesn't have COVID right now, she'll get it regardless if you take her to the hospital. And, you know, I'm thankful that they didn't take her to the hospital because, you know, you're going to be, I don't know how they do it in Mexico because I'm just not familiar with their system, but they're probably not going to allow visitations. And overall, just like, 
I would say hospitals just don't do a really good care in like the emotional needs of a person and just being and I would not want my grandmother to pass away at a hospital and not being able to see a friendly face and stuff so you know I'm glad that they kept her home and she was able to spend her final days at home with her family surrounding her and stuff so that that's sort of a segue into um, some of the obstacles that the pandemic has presented for the care mm -hmm. of patients in a facility like the one that you work at. Mm -hmm. um, the isolation, which probably is already a problem just even in normal times of having yeah. you know contact and support from family, but with quarantine rules, uh, to have the patient uh, not have the family be able to to be in the room to connect with them and to advocate for them. How yeah. have you seen that play out in your facility? Well, for my facility right now, we like, I think we've been in lockdown since I want to say early March. And it was like, as soon as we got the, the governor's orders, we were just like straight, we're on lockdown. I think the administrator sent like masks, phone calls and, you know, sent letters to the, the patients and to the families, like per the governor's orders, we are on lockdown. Nobody can get in or out unless they're an employee. If you, if like family members want to drop off anything, they need to drop it off at the receptionist and then the workers will drop it off to the patient's room. Um, only phone calls for, um, for contact basically or if you um, if you want to you know see the person you can ask um, activities to um, to use an iPad that we have that way you can have like FaceTime or you know video chats and stuff but you know it's just there's basically like no physical communication because even within the facility all patients must be in their rooms basically 24 seven, unless you're having therapy done. And then you can go to like the first floor. And even when you're having therapy, it's only like maybe three people that are allowed to get therapy at a time. Cause um, they have to do like social distancing and stuff. Like you're in your room basically from morning to night. Your only interaction is with the nurses or the CNAs. Um, you might talk to um, activities if you're asking for like supplies to, for like crayons or stuff like that. But a lot of the time, like, and it's, I think it's only been recent that we've been allowing, um, what's it called, face to face or like outside visiting. Like, we would take the patients outside and the family would be outside too, but they would be six feet apart. But when we start having an uptick in like COVID um, responses or COVID tests, we had to shut that down. Like there's no visitation at all now. And I think that like um, outside visitation only lasted for like maybe a month at most. But even then, like um, people, the visitors had to be tested for COVID a uh, day before and then temperatures checked, everything like vitals checked and stuff. So it was like, it was kind of hard to like do it at, to get the visitations ready. Yeah. And without the family being there in the room, has that put you at all in the role of advocating or communicating for the patients that maybe you didn't have to, to do before the pandemic? Um, I feel like in the beginning, maybe from February to like maybe I would say maybe June, like it didn't really change too much because the majority of the people are, you know, alert and orientated. They could like, if they wanted to have, um, like they didn't like their medicine that they were taking, they could tell the nurse themselves that, oh, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to take this drug anymore. It makes me nauseous or it makes me, you know, tired or I just don't like the results of it. Like they could talk to the nurse themselves and, you know, the nurse would talk to the doctor, they would get back to each other and stuff. So like, I didn't really need to do a lot. But past June, we started getting those more confused patients. And, you know, I would, 
you like and if you got used to certain patients and they knew like you didn't they didn't like certain things you could probably talk to the nurse and tell her like so and so doesn't like how you're doing that or so and so is really uncomfortable when you know where you're doing their wound dressing like it's more painful to do it like that can they have a pain pill before you do the wound dressing so just little things you started doing but as a cna you really don't have like a lot of like you can tell the nurse but it's it's like up to the nurse if they're gonna like pay attention to what you say or not so for advocating for certain care is a little hard like, I think the most that I have a lot of control over is showers. And, you know, some patients will, like, not want to do showers because they're just so tired or they just feel nauseous or they're so sick. And, you know, they really try to get people to take showers as much as often because, you know, it's just cleansing, like, cleansing thing. But, you know, if the patient is, like, so adamant about, like, not taking a shower that day, I'll, like, I'll tell the nurse, and if they try to force me to do it, I'm just, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to the patient if they want to refuse care for me, and if they don't want to do a shower, that's, you know, that's their right, so, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just be, like, I'll try to do, like, maybe a bed bath, or at least, like, do those armpits, or the face, and, you know, other parts, but, you know, if they're really really refusing that thing like i'll have to agree with them like i can't force someone to do it so i would say that and how about your uh role as a latina healthcare provider and being able to speak spanish can you tell us a little bit about how that's played out yeah well i would say at the place where i'm at now the rehabilitation place i've had maybe I would say, from what I can remember right now, I've had two um, Latin um, patients, and one was Puerto Rican, and one was like a little Mexican man. And for one of the patients, they she could not speak any English at all. She only spoke Spanish. And I know for like our morning shift, like there's really no Spanish speaking um, CNAs there or nurses. So when I, when usually when I got there for the first time and she saw me and she's like, hablas espanol? And I was just like, yes. And she's just like, thank God. <laughs> Cause I, and then I started like talking to her and she's just like, no one understands me. Like I want some water cause I ran out and someone hasn't refilled it. I want to be on my side because, you know, I've been laying on my back for like a while and I'm tired of it. And she, and she was just like, I really want someone to brush my hair because it's starting to get matted and stuff. So, um, and this woman was like really weak. So like, I would have to, as soon as I got there, you know, I'm like, okay, let me go get someone to help me so I can prop you up. I can like start untangling your hair and let me get you some water so we can get you hydrated again so you know you're obviously really thirsty so you know just having because I feel like a lot of times if like if you don't if a lot of CNAs don't speak the same language as the person that they're giving care to like they won't know exactly what care they need so they'll just do like okay I'll clean you up really fast and let me like do you need anything else and they'll say something in their language and if they don't understand it they're kind of just like do you need anything else and they'll repeat it but they don't know what they're saying so they're like okay I guess you don't need anything and you know fortunately they still need care like they it's just that you don't understand it so you're assuming that they don't need anything like I've had maybe I've had an Asian person who was speaking Mandarin and obviously I don't know Mandarin, but I'm just like, okay, let me pull out my phone and use Google Translate because like, I don't know your language, but I have a phone that I can use to like, at least help me get a big understanding of what you need and stuff. Or sometimes like, if like, if I have this full of uh, the Polish person speaking, like, you know, you kind of do like, um, what's it called? Checker, or no, not charades. You know, do you need to go to the bathroom? Do you want to eat? Like, <laughs> are you thirsty? Like, what do you need? And you kind of figure it out. But um, 
for the Spanish speaking, so, like as soon as I get there and they understand that I can speak Spanish, they get so happy because like finally someone that understands me and stuff. So like um for and I feel like a, a major like for CNAs, like I feel like a majority like if they speak Spanish, like it's just so helpful because when you're a patient and nobody can understand you like you I feel like a lot of the patients they say that they feel very lonely like they don't feel understood like they're not getting the best care that they could and stuff so you know just having someone that can speak that language is so important and assuring and you know it just makes them more comfortable I think And there's no provision in the facility for having a translator for to communicate to them their care or anything like that. There's no official. Uh, I would like, no, I wouldn't think, I don't think so. Cause you know, for the, I think we had that one lady that couldn't speak English. Like I think maybe a week into her being there. Like I think they set up little cue cards for her, but you know, a week is just so late. Like, you know, she needed, she needs to be able to under, to communicate as soon as she gets there, because, you know, this is a healthcare place, like, you, like, what if she's saying she's having pain in her chest, or what if she's saying she's having, like, extreme, like, pain in her stomach, or something that, you know, is like, what if she has a heart attack, like, and she can't get anybody to understand her, and stuff, so I feel like that's really, like, dangerous because even in my other job in the nursing home um and that was like a long-term nursing home it did have like rehab place on one wing but like even then like you're kind of like left to either the family figures out how to like I think I had one family member bring like flashcards that were made just for her like okay this is how usually what she needs and just show it to her or they had it in like a little like notebook ringlet thing to always keep track on her but you know a lot of places don't really have like a way for patients to communicate with themselves like um i feel like hospitals have translators there but like rehabs and nursing homes don't really have that because you know they assume you're going to speak english at most and stuff so how has COVID-19, this experience with COVID-19 and caring for people affected uh, how you feel about um, your job and how do you see your future in healthcare, if any? Mm, well, I feel like, um, I think regardless, I'm still gonna go back to work because though, um, since I am, I do speak Spanish and like we need people that can you know, speak Spanish and, you know, take care of people. Like, even though, like, I might not, because, you know, like, like I said, we've only had maybe two Spanish-speaking people in the six months that I worked there. Like, you know, you never know when you're going to need another one and stuff. And let me see. Um, yeah, I, well, I think regardless, um, I'm just gonna keep doing CNA work because we just need CNAs. There's such a shortage of it that, you know, if I can't do the job, I, I'll try to do the job. It's only until it gets too like unbearable that I'll have to find another place to work at. <laughs> Cause you know, you if I, there's like maybe 20 nursing homes in my area and they're for sure gonna need someone <laughs> and stuff, but yeah. So we're talking about, with your experience, mm -hmm. the most essential workers, such as yourself, and a very vulnerable population when it comes to COVID-19. So do you have any thoughts on how the leadership in this country and society in general have dealt with this crisis? <laughs> well, I know for this country, they've done such a horrible job compared to other countries. Like, I know, uh, well, I feel like the United States just doesn't have a good, they just don't understand science and they're very like, they don't, 
the way well it just goes back to how they teach it in in schools like they don't teach science well and people aren't trained to like understand the data and stuff and then you know kids grow up and they don't they don't like this is how we got to this pandemic because people don't understand the actual data from like the who or the cdc and um like half of our like the pandemic in the united states could have been avoided if people took the precautions seriously if we didn't have fox news saying this is a china virus that this is you know it's not dangerous to so and so and stuff like you know my facility we've had what i call baby covid and which is like it has it doesn't have like extreme symptoms but you know that's just because my facility isn't equipped to take on people that are on ventilators and you know can't breathe or need oxygen like pumped into them in high volumes like you know that's why we have sherman they're taking in the people that you know are on ventilators and stuff and you know i i'm thankful that i'm in illinois and um the governor has done such a good job on cracking down on covid because if you go to our other states like wisconsin who are you know protesting their right to not wear a mask or florida having you know that spring um spring break and all those young kids going into you know bars and you know saying if I get COVID I get COVID like you know I feel like the USA has such a individualist um mindset that they don't think about the community because you know even if like even if I'm if I just because I'm young and I know COVID isn't going to affect me if I'm for some reason, well, back when I didn't have COVID, if I for some reason um, even like had it or shared it, like even though I know it's not gonna affect me as much as another person, I have to take care of, you know, my family, I have to take care of my Nana who's, you know, elderly, has lupus, has a bunch of already like, um, um, what's it called, you know, bad lungs. Like if I had given it to her, like, you know, I'm putting her in danger of it. And I feel like a lot of people don't, like they don't understand that the, um, that the precaution social distancing isn't for like young people. It's for the people that are vulnerable to like COVID, like who have like low immune systems and people just need to, you know, stop thinking about themselves and think about their whole community as a whole. Like that. that's why like, um, I think Vietnam has like a less than 1% chance of COVID spreading because the whole government like ordered everybody to be on the lockdown. The government gave like supplies for people to, you know, for food, for utilities, like gave, they gave them whole packages and people just stayed home and they dropped them off. And like, that's how they got their COVID rates so low. Even like, you know, Japan who has, um, even before COVID, everybody wore masks. So like people, you wouldn't spread the germs around and stuff. So, you know, you just, and you know, America doesn't have universal health care. We have, you know, paid for health care. And, you know, I'm one of the people that doesn't have health care. So, you know, even like, even if I develop really like severe COVID symptoms, if I go to a hospital, I know I'm going to get into serious debt. And, you know, it's just, funny how you know you're a healthcare worker but you don't have health care at all and you're kind of just like okay like I take care of people that have health care but I don't myself don't have health care so it's just you know frustrating but you're kind of just like okay I guess this is just how it is oh yeah <laughs> uh, no. it shouldn't be that way yeah unfortunately my a lot of like my the current facility I'm at and the, my old facility they will the healthcare that they were offering was, you know, going to take like basically maybe half of my paycheck. And, you know, I have bills to pay. I have to, you know, I have a lot of stuff I need to pay for. And, you know, I rather survive than, you know, pay for healthcare that, you know, I'm probably not going to use and probably will give me into more debt, unfortunately. So, you know, you're just kind of like taking your chance. <laughs> and so, but yeah. 
I don't know if that answered the question. I'm kind of bad at answering some sure. questions. Sure, <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share with me about your experiences that I haven't asked you about? Um, well, I'm trying to think, but I feel like for just as a Latinx CNA who I, you know, I've worked in healthcare for about eight years and I think just I just want to say that we just need more people of color to be in healthcare because, you know, it's just so much better to have people that look like you take care of you. Like, you know, you know, I can count maybe eight people that I've taken care of that um, look like me and they're so happy because I'm just like, okay, you understand me or like you you know like some of the issues that I have to go through so it's easier for you to like understand me and I don't have to go through and explaining like my struggle like you know I might not have papers so can you help me with certain things like am I gonna have to like show paperwork am I in you know am I in danger of getting deported while I'm at this facility and stuff and you know just you know, just having someone that looks like you that can kind of help you is just so important. And, and what's it called? And for just taking care of like um, elderly, like Lat Latino people is just like, you have to have, you have to care for them a bit more than your other people. Cause you know, like all the other white people are gonna get care regardless, but like, a lot of the Latino people are really vulnerable in these facilities because, you know, they can't communicate and stuff. And sometimes their family members, like, can't help them as much because they don't understand what's going on. Like, they don't understand the paperwork that they're signing. So, you know, they have to be, like, they'll try to, like, you know, call to us and be like, what am I signing? Like, I'm kind of confused and stuff. Because if they don't understand English, either good and, you know, they don't have, like, a translator to help them, like, you have to try to help them too a bit so you know you, just being there is so important and you know just helping them understand and just being compassionate to them is so important too have you found yourself in that role with family members of trying to communicate what they need to know which they're not understanding um i feel like from my at the nursing home i had to like I feel like, well, this isn't for me, but like this is um, one of my friends had a family member who went to a nursing home and their grandpa had a fall. And I think that facility was trying to tell them and their parents that, you know, they didn't fall like they they had like therapy was with them. So it wasn't a fall. But, you know, like the the her her granddaughter, my friend, was like asking her grandpa, like, what happened? Like, how did you fall? Like, was someone with you? And the grandpa was, you know, telling her, like, I was in my room by myself when it happened. So you can see, like, if the granddaughter wasn't there, like, trying to asking all those important questions, because, you know, you know, nursing homes will lie, unfortunately, to, like, cover their butts. And, you know, this could have, like, if they had fallen and they had really severely injured themselves, like, that, that could have been, like, a whole lawsuit, like, lost and stuff, because the way they were wording certain stuff would have helped their case and stuff. So, luckily, my friend had, like, asked her grandpa, like, all the right questions, and, you know, if, if for some reason they weren't there, and she had her own experience as being a CNA, like, you know, their grandpa could have been, like, really hurt and stuff, so, you know, it's important and stuff, and, like, I've had, like, so I haven't had any, like, direct, like, experiences like that, but, like, I think the most I had done was telling certain family members, like, you really need to advocate for your mom more because, you know, your mom is complaining about a lot of pain, and every time, like, I would tell a nurse, like, they're asking for, like, another pain pill. And they're just like, they had one already. They won't get one for another four hours. Like, you, like, I would tell them, then maybe there's something, you know, maybe their pain is just on a, they need to up 
their dosage and they'll just be like eh, I think they're faking it and stuff so you know I would tell the I would if the family came to visit you know I would tell them you probably need to go talk to your doctor for your mom because you know they're saying they're in more pain and you know obviously we don't want people in pain because it's just not good and you know eventually it will get like hopefully if I would talk to the family enough they would listen to me and you know take care of their you know they would get it taken care of and stuff so. well I really want to thank you Mar for sharing your story with us and with yeah. future scholars and others to help yeah. them understand what it was like yeah. experiencing this moment in history yeah. and we we wish you a speedy recovery and all yeah. the best going forward yeah 10 more days yeah yeah so yeah thank you